It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Nickelback. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Every question period in this Parliament, the official opposition has brought the story of struggling Ontarians. People who waited hours in the emergency room in pain. People who had to leave the hospital without getting the care they needed. People who have waited in agony for urgent surgery. All this because of staff shortages being made worse every day by this government's action. Why is this government willing to make the waiting worse by expanding private surgical clinic, siphoning more of our staff away from public hospitals? And to respond, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, we have always said that we need to um, look at these challenges in a way that goes outside of what we are currently doing in the province of Ontario. As the member opposite knows, we do have uh, clinics like the Shouldais Hospital that currently operate and have operated for decades in the province of Ontario. We will continue to work with those partners, all partnerships. We've seen innovative models with community care paramedics. We've seen innovative models with uh, 911 uh, offloads with uh, dedicated offload nurse practitioners who are able to take those uh, emergency department um, patients so that the paramedics can go back out onto the road. All of these are innovations, new ways of approaching an existing Response. problem that has been plaguing our health care system for, frankly, years and years, and we're going to make sure that those innovations are available to all communities. I've often spoken about the paramedic program that's available in 49 areas. We're going to expand that because it's working. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Over the last month, families in Ontario have watched and across the province, sorry, have watched as the crisis across their province in health care has gone worse and worse. Over the summer, at least 26 hospitals have been forced to close their emergency department to patients. And across the province, nurses and healthcare workers are leaving in droves. More than ever, we need a plan to strengthen publicly delivered health care and support nurses and frontline health care workers who provide it. Why is this government so determined to let this crisis go on and tell us that the only way out is to privatize more of our health care system. Minister of Health. You know, I'm, uh, I'm proud of the work that we've already put in place. We've already expanded the ability for hospitals to have more post-surgeries happening beyond the, the uh, standard 9 to 5 or 9 to 6 operations. Uh, we're easing pressures on our emergency department. And of course, as recently as this week, the, colleges of, uh, the College of Nurses has now worked with us and expedited internationally educated healthcare workers. You know, we're working with our partners when they bring forward ideas and suggestions that we see have an opportunity to improve the health human resources in Ontario, we're doing that. This is not a Ontario exclusive issue. We're seeing it in jurisdictions across Canada, indeed the world, but we're making sure where we have opportunities for engagement, for improvements, Response. we're doing that. And of course, most recently, that's the Colleges of Nurses with our internationally trained educators. Thank you. Final Nurses and healthcare workers have been crystal clear. This government is making the healthcare crisis worse, whether it is punishing seniors by forcing them away from their family into substandard for profit long term care home, whether it is funding more for profit clinics, pulling money away, money and staff away from the public system. The crisis is getting worse, not better. No one in Ontario should be wondering whether the emergency department is going to be open when they need it. Will the government stop selling more of our health care system to private investors and bring in a staffing strategy that will improve publicly delivered health care? Thank you, Speaker. You know, I'm proud of the fact that our five-point plan that we announced last, last uh, month with the Minister of Long-Term Care has already started to bear fruit. We've seen that with a, a willingness 
and it, frankly excitement from both the College of Nurses and the Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario where they are going to expedite and they've brought forward additional ideas on how we can get those internationally educated um, healthcare workers here working in Ontario. We're doing that because we know we want to have the best health care system in the province of Ontario. We're doing that by working with our hospital partners, our nursing partners, our paramedics. Our, you, you, you talk about individual situations. We're actually coming up with ideas. We're listening to the experts in the field, and we're acting on those ideas. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you. Good morning, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. After two long years of interruption and remote learning, parents sent their kids off to school this week. They're looking for peace and stability and supports in the classroom so their kids can finally get back to some sort of normal. Yet, day after day, this Minister of Education is ratcheting up the rhetoric against the people who make our schools work. Why does this government seem so determined to create conflict in our classrooms? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we are determined to stand up for the voices of parents in this province who want their kids in class. And this Premier and our government has been crystal clear on our intention. It is to ensure that these kids have a more normal, stable and enjoyable return to class right to June without disruption. And I ask all members of this legislature to join the government to oppose these types of impacts on kids. While we agree, uh, while we agree Speaker, that we could have a, a very spirited debate at the negotiating table. What we disagree with is the imposition of a strike on a child after two extraordinary and difficult years. We want them in school. We want them to learn. We want them to be nourished and supported by their educators and their friends. And, Speaker, I hope all members of this House will stand with this government to keep kids in school right to June. Supplementary question. Speaker, the minister claiming he's here to help parents is like Godzilla claiming he's come to save Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> parents and teachers remember the PC record of cuts and conflicts, mandatory online learning, 10,000 planned layoffs, freezing wages with Bill 124, working with the Liberals to freeze wages with 115. Does the minister understand that attacking people the very people who make our schools work is what puts the school year at risk. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with $683 million more for this September, with a 6 per cent increase over the former Liberals when it comes to investments in public education, we're talking about per student funding up almost $340 per child over last year, Mr. Speaker, a $92 million increase in special education, a $10 million net increase in mental health, now 420 percent increase from when the former Liberals were in power, Speaker. We have $175 million in tutoring, the largest program of its kind in this nation. And, Speaker, we have increased investment for ventilation, for HEPA filtration, by another $600 million. There is no government in the history of this province that has invested more in public education, and our Premier and our party will continue to invest to ensure a safe, stable and enjoyable return to school for these kids in this province. Final supplementary. Speaker, paychecks are being eaten away by rampant inflation, legislated wage freezes, and yet our education workers show up every day in our schools working so hard for our kids. They deserve respect. They have clear ideas on how to improve our schools. Smaller class sizes, mental health supports, fixing the decades of backlogged capital repairs. Will the minister start implementing these ideas to improve our schools and stop creating conflict in our classrooms? Mr. Speaker, we are listening to the voices of parents in this province who want their kids to be in school, and we are standing up for them to ensure stability and a more normal return to class. Mr. Speaker, that's why we put in place a tutoring expansion, because we know, and our Premier knows, that these kids need to get back on track with their studies, and that's why we've invested in a historic plan to increase access to more educators. There's 5,000 more staff in our schools this September, because our government and our premier had the foresight Order. to invest in a plan to catch up, we have $600 million more dollars in public, publicly funded education investment. Order. And, Mr. Speaker, on top of all of this, the number one guiding priority of the government when it comes to these negotiations, a contrast with the opposition, is we're going to stand up for kids and keep them in school right to June. Thank you. The next question.
question the member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. My question is to the Premier. Good morning, Premier. Um, you should know I received an upsetting call regarding a 90-year-old woman in my riding. She'd been living independently at her home, receiving home care three times a week. She recently spent a short while in hospital. When she was discharged, the Lynn and the hospital signed off on her care plan, which was to include home care. When she returned back home alone, she was informed that it would be at least three weeks for her just to be assessed and that there was no home care available for her. She felt abandoned and frightened, as we all would. Why is this government punishing our seniors instead of fixing the health care crisis? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, the member opposite highlights exactly why our most recent budget included a $1 billion investment in community care investments. And I've highlighted, and I'm going to highlight it again, because it is important for your constituent and your community to understand what that billion-dollar investment is going to get them. It is 739,000 nursing visits. It's 157,000 nursing shift hours. It is 117,000 therapy visits, including physiotherapy, occupational therapy, and speech-language pathology in community, Speaker. It's 2,100,000. 118,000 hours of personal support services in community, 236,000 other types of home care visits. It is precisely why we, have, as a government, has made, have made that investment of a billion dollars in the community care Spons. programs in the province of Ontario, and it is, frankly, disappointing that the member opposite does not see the value of that and did not support it. Yep. 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 The supplementary question. To the minister, I would like to say that your words uh, do not bring home care to the people in my community That's because right. the money is not in the field. That's right. And That's instead right. of home care, this 90-year-old woman was offered two choices. She could pay for private care or she could be readmitted to the hospital. This is truly unbelievable. When will this government fix our public home care system and stop? Please stop turning your backs on seniors. Minister of Health. Thank you. This, um, that's not all, Speaker. We actually have also invested nearly $100 million in additional funding over the next three years to expand community care service programs such as adult day programs, meal services, transportation, caregiver support, and assistive living services and caregiver support. You know, these are the organizations that are so active in our community, with volunteers like Meals on Wheels, who are doing that work to make sure that our seniors, our, our frail who are recovering at home, have the supports they need to do it safely in Order. their own home in their community, surrounded by family Order. that loves them, neighbours who understand what their needs are. This is what we are doing as a government, enabling those organizations to do what they do so well, which is looking after our neighbours. Thank you. Order. The next question, the member for Markham Unionville. Mr. So speaker. speaker, in my writing, I see firsthand how harmful Ontario's labour shortage truly is for small businesses. Employers and businesses want to do more but simply cannot because of the limited supply of workers. The skilled and semi-skilled labour shortage remains one of the main factors limiting business growth. Jobs are waiting to be filled and paychecks are waiting to be collected. Speaker, my question is straightforward. Will the Minister of Labour, Immigration Training and Skilled Development Please explain to this legislature what our government is doing to address Ontario's historic labour shortage issue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Labour, Immigration, and Training and Skills Development. Thank you very much, and I want to thank the member uh, from Markham Unionville for this very important question. Uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, our government really understands Ontario is facing a historic labour shortage. In fact, uh, today in the province, there's nearly 400,000 jobs going unfilled. We need all hands on deck to build a stronger Ontario. That is why we're connecting job seekers with the skills and training that they need and promoting the lifelong careers that are available in the skilled trades. We're also making it easier for out-of-province workers and immigrants to fill in-demand jobs and calling on skilled workers from right across Canada and abroad to come here to Ontario to collect these paychecks that are waiting to be collected. Mr. Speaker, our government has an ambitious plan to build, and we're going to get it done. Thank you. 
The supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, for that reassuring response. Speaker, about one in five new jobs in Ontario over the next five years will be related to skilled trades. So, to tackle the labour shortage, we must address the skills gap and continue promoting the skilled trades. The skilled trades can provide young people access to these incredible, meaningful careers that will keep many of our local industries thriving. Speaker, once again to the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. What is our government doing to promote the skilled trades in Ontario? Thank you. Mr. Labour. Thank you again to the member for that very important question. As a government, uh, we are determined to continue to open doors for young people and help them get the training and financial supports that they need. It's our mission to give more people a hand up to better jobs and bigger paychecks. That's why our government is investing billions in innovative training programs that connect workers to these bigger paychecks. And working together with our labour unions, government and business, we're making Ontario a place where hard work pays off and big dreams come to life. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, this government claims Ontarians are accessing the health care they need when they need it. But a constituent of mine reached out after their partner waited eight hours in an ER after having a stroke. Wow. Waiting alone, without family, with only the paramedics who brought them in. Eight hours. Is it acceptable to the Premier that anyone should have to suffer like this after having a stroke? Oh. Okay. Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, the member opposite highlights exactly why we have been investing and will continue to invest in our health care system. To be clear, nine out of ten high urgency patients finish their emergency visits within target times, and her surgeries are happening at 88 percent of their pre pandemic rate. Now, we've already added 3,500 hospital beds. We've already added 10,900 new hospital um, HHR, so nurses, PSWs, doctors. We'll continue to do this work because we understand that we want to make sure that we have a robust health care system in the province of Ontario, and most importantly, Speaker, where people want to be whether that is needed hospital in acute care during acute care crisis, whether that is in their own home recovering, whether that is in a rehab bed, in a, in a facility, or indeed a long-term care bed. We are doing this work. We are making these investments Response. because we understand it is needed in the province of Ontario to deal with our aging population. Thank you. Thank you. Through you, Speaker, 9 out of 10 isn't good enough, certainly not good enough for the 10th patient. Without nurses available, paramedics had to stay with my constituent, even over a shift change. Only by sheer luck, the second massive stroke happened after my constituent was in a bed and caught just in time. Wait times continue to grow. The next patient might not be so lucky. Will this government invest the 1.8 billion health care dollars they hoarded last year and respect health care workers by repealing Bill 124, or will they keep strangling our public system? Thank you. Speaker, the member opposite actually highlights one of the things that we should be lauding in the province of Ontario, and that is, of course, our community paramedics. The amazing work they have been doing in community, in hospital, to protect our most vulnerable. You know, I've often spoke to, spoken about a, a, a 49 pilot projects that are currently happening in communities across Solid. Ontario, 911 models of care pilot projects, which have borne amazing fruit. We have, indeed, in uh, London, Middlesex, we have a success rate of 84 percent and satisfaction rate of over 80 percent, where individuals who were able to be cared for by their community paramedics in their community appreciated and understood that this was the most important and the most valuable role that they could play. We're going to continue to do that work. We're going to expand those models of care that are working in our community to make sure that every uh, community has an opportunity to fully utilize their paramedics because, frankly, sir, they've, made, they've been making a huge difference in our community. Good Good Next question, the member for Mississauga Mall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through you. 
Mr. Speaker, the Toronto Region Board of Trade estimates that the gridlock adds $400 million to the cost of goods in the region every year. This morning, for an example, it took me one hour, 20 minutes to drive for 40 kilometers to come to Queen's Park. This gridlock is resulting in lost productivity, adds strain on the physical and mental health. Commuters are losing over 3 million hours a year sitting in traffic. Time, Ontarians should be engaged in what they love to do, work hard to grow, and spending quality time with loved ones. Mr. Speaker, we see firsthand how decades of inaction and underinvestment in transportation infrastructure have hurt Ontarians. In my community, I hear from constituents repeatedly how fed up they are sitting with gridlock. Speaker, to the Minister of Transportation, can you please tell us what this government is doing to tackle the gridlock crisis plaguing our Ontario? Thank you, Mr. Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Mississauga Malton for the great question. Speaker, we cannot afford to delay much needed infrastructure investments. More delays equals more gridlock. Our Premier is leading an ambitious plan to deliver the right balance of public transit and road infrastructure projects to keep pace with the demands of today and the future. Over the next 10 years, we're investing more than $25.1 billion to support the planning and construction of highway expansion and rehabilitation projects across the province. As part of these efforts, we're getting on with the building of new highways, like Highway 413 and the Bradford Bypass. And, Speaker, with finishing long overdue projects like the expansion of Highway 7 between Kitchener and Guelph and highway th the Highway 3 widening between Windsor and Leamington. Speaker, it's not enough just to talk about building a better future under our PC government. Response. We are getting it done. Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Thank you for your assurance and action to solve the gridlock. Speaker, when the Liberals were in power, they talked a lot about building infrastructure. But at the end of the day, that's all it was, talk. The fact is, especially when it comes to transportation, Ontario has an infrastructure deficit that the Liberals caused. With Greater Golden Horseshoe attracting 2 million people in Every 10 years, we are going to reach 15 million by 2051, more than the people we have in Ontario today. Unless we do something now, the problem we face today will only get worse. When it comes to fighting gridlock, we have heard no solutions from the opposition except to pretend that all growth can be solved by transit. But, Speaker, we know we need all hands on deck to address this issue. So through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister of Transportation, can she share to the members of this House and my residents about the government's plan to keep Ontarians moving? Great thank question. you, Mr. Speaker. Great thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Speaker, members, of the members in this House of the Opposition parties will tell you there's a choice between building transit and building highways, and that's just not true. Our government is building both. For every dollar that we are spending on highways, our government is spending three more to build transit. And, Speaker, over the next 10 years, we're investing more than $61 billion to expand and build new transit alone. This includes the largest plan for subway builds in Canadian history and delivering on our government's mandate on two-way, all-day, 15-minute service across core segments of the GO network. Speaker, expanding our highway and transit networks together will allow us to pave the way for a future that offers more transportation options and less gridlock for commuters, all while creating thousands of good-paying jobs in communities right here at home. Response. Speaker, the wheels are in motion. The government is getting it done. <laughs> Member for Thunder Bay Superior North. My question is to the Premier. For two weeks, along with several of my colleagues, I am living on a social assistance grocery budget of $47.60 a week. Many people who have to rely on social assistance have contacted us since this action went public to tell us that the meagre amount we have allowed ourselves for food is almost double what a single person living on social assistance has available for food 
after paying rent. Indeed, it is abundantly clear that the government needs to double the rates of ODSP and Ontario Works. Will the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services join us for this two-week advocacy effort so that she might better understand, even briefly, the hardship that ODSP and OW recipients have to endure in their daily lives? Good question. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite. I have spent decades uh, as a physician assisting people uh, on ODSP, assisting people to get the services that they need. So I, I have a, a probably a better understanding than most of what people are going through. And I'm very proud of our government's, very proud of our government's efforts to make sure that our vulnerable are served. That's including the historic investment in ODSP uh, uh, that's never been done before in the history of this program, making sure it's aligned with inflation, working across government uh, to make sure that we have programs that are available to people when they need it. Uh, that's including working with the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development to get people back into the workforce when they're able and looking to support people when they're not through the many programs that we offer uh, that are, are I listed yesterday as, as the uh, member would know and would be aware of. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, back to the Minister. Minister. 900,000 people in Ontario are living on social assistance and they're living in poverty. And their biggest expense is housing. Upwards of 60% of a person's social assistance income is going to housing. You cannot afford to live on $733 a month if you're on Ontario Works, or $1,227 a month if you're on disability payments. Minister, I am asking you to join us on this social assistance diet to, f to have a better understanding yes. of what it is like uh, to, to be on social assistance, and I'm calling on this government to double social assistance rates to help people get out of poverty. Can you do that? I remind the members to make their comments to the chair. The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services may reply. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again for the question. I will continue to work with all of my colleagues across government, working across levels of government, with the municipalities, with the federal government, encouraging our federal counterparts to bring forward their plan for the Canadian disability benefit. We have urged them to do this. We understand the importance of it. We're working on the transformation with our municipal partners to put more services into the front where people can benefit from that when they, they need that expertise in their local communities. This is on top of the historic investment that we're making in ODSP. And this is an all-of-government approach. Uh, this is requiring the, the labour pool to be addressed, getting people back into the workforce as quickly as possible, understanding the mechanisms that we have to allow people to live in dignity and with respect, uh, purposeful and, and with meaning. And this is something that we're working with the, the Minister of Finance, the Treasury Board, uh, Minister of Labour, uh, uh, Immigration, Training and Skills Development, Minister of Education, Minister of Health. This is across the board. It's something that the previous government never did. Uh, that was. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, Member for Kingston and the Island. Mr. Speaker, we're in a rush to procure enough electricity to replace the Pickering nuclear plant closing in 2025. How do we know it's a rush? Well, this government has an expedited procurement for, priority, uh, for power starting in 2027, with a big bonus for starting earlier. For example, you produce electricity on business days between April, uh, sorry, May and August 2025, they'll pay you 50% more. In July 2018, this government cancelled renewable energy projects, letting hundreds of millions of dollars of investments go down the drain and losing four precious years. The Premier said then that he was, quote, so proud to have done that. And now we realize we need that clean electricity. You have to dig a little, but the list of qualified applicants for the next round of long-term procurement is full of renewable energy. Can we just admit that this government is quietly getting back into renewable energy, something it should never have abandoned? The Minister of Energy. Well, uh, Speaker, thanks to the member opposite for the question this morning. What our government is committed to is ensuring that the people of Ontario and the businesses on, in Ontario have a reliable supply of electricity, Mr. Speaker, that we have an affordable 
here, supply here. of Absol electricity, absolutely. something that never happened under the previous government's watch. As a matter of fact, as hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs left our province, they left our country for other jurisdictions because of the Liberal energy policies, Mr. Now. Speaker. What we have done through the success of our Premier strategy and our Minister of Economic Development, bringing companies back, repatriating companies back to Ontario by electrifying our vehicle fleet, by electrifying our green steelmaking process, Mr. Speaker, we need electricity, and we have a competitive procurement in place to acquire that electricity—790 megawatts, as a matter of fact, in the most recent procurement at a 30 per cent savings from what was contracted by the previous government, Mr. Speaker. Questions. Mr. Speaker, you know, when the plants are already built under a previous government, of course it's cheaper to keep them running. La clôture de la centrale Pickering constitutes. The Pickering plant is a threat. We cannot wait until the next election to replace the energy that's going to be lost by the closing of the Pickering power plant. So I would like to know the plan. The following question for the good of Ontario. We'll need to produce lots of renewable energy quickly. Developers are already approaching landowners quietly in anticipation. Could the Energy and Municipal Affairs Ministers talk, then start now to help municipalities prepare for deciding how they will or will not be part of this critical project? For example, could they help municipalities decide whether or not to zone areas for wind and solar projects now so that developers could know beforehand where they could Order. build clean energy projects with the speed we need. Question. The response, uh, Minister Mr. Energy. Speaker, uh, merci pour la question. Thank you for the question. Mr. Speaker, for the member of the government. Mr. Speaker, I know that's a new member over there, and he probably doesn't remember the policies of the previous Liberal government that forced, they were doozies. forced energy projects onto communities without any type of consultation, Mr. Speaker. They didn't care about a willing host community over there, Mr. Speaker, which is why in 2018 the people of Ontario reduced that party to seven seats. Mr. Speaker. And you know what? The people of Ontario didn't forget in 2022, <laughs> because now they've got eight seats, Mr. Speaker, largely because of the energy policy, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and our government has committed to working with the municipalities and the independent electricity Response. system operator to make sure there's consultation with the municip municipalities for new energy projects so that we don't have the mess, the divisiveness, mess. the unaffordable crisis that we saw in Ontario created by the previous Liberal government. come to order so we can resume question period. Start the clock. The member for Ajax. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We know that even before the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a shortage of doctors in Ontario. Many Ontarians have challenges accessing a family doctor for years which has significantly impacted their health and well-being. The rapid growth in areas like my riding of Ajax and other areas in the GTA has only increased this problem of doctor retention and recru recruitment. The previous the Liberal government did not take the necessary leadership and make the critical health care investments when they had the opportunity. Speaker, can the Minister of Colleges and Universities please inform the House what our government is doing to address the doctor shortages across Ontario? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Ajax for that question. We need to increase the number of doctors and health care workers across the province, and that includes rural and remote communities and communities like hers in the GTA. That is why our government has taken historic action by building new medical schools in Ontario. The new Toronto Metropolitan University Medical School in Brampton. This is the first new medical school in the GTA since the University of Toronto opened in 1843. 
We are also creating the University of Toronto Academy of Medicine and Integrated Health in Scarborough and expanding the Queen's Lake Ridge Health Campus in Oshawa. But we recognize that more action needs to be done across the province. That is why we also created the first standalone medical school in the north through the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. We've also invested in post-secondary health care programs like Learn and Stay, and we continue to work with the Ministry of Long-Term Care to increase the number of PSWs and nurses in Ontario. We are working to fill the gaps across the health care system and across the province after 15 years of Liberal mismanagement. By making these Response. investments in post-secondary education today, our expansions will help to serve a growing and aging population in the years and decades to come. Great. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, the urgency for training new doctors in our province is critical. The people of my riding of Ajax, especially our seniors, ex for experienced firsthand the devastating and negative impacts that medical education cuts by the previous Liberal government had on the quality of their health care. If the previous government had made the badly needed investment in human health resources and medical residences years ago, my constituents and all of Ontarians would not be in the position we currently face. I was really shocked to hear that no other government had invested in creating a new medical school in Ontario, in the GTA, in Canada for over 100 years. Speaker, can the Minister of Ed Colleges and Universities please tell the House what our government's plan is for training more doctors so that Ontarians can have access to health care resources that they need? Mr. Colleges and Universities. The member for that question and building new medical schools will increase the number of doctors in communities like Ajax, the Durham region, and the whole of Ontario. However, Speaker, our work to enhance healthcare infrastructure does not stop there. Speaker, our government is making record investments in innovative approaches across the healthcare system, investments that the NDP and Liberals did not make. That's why earlier this year we announced that we are making historic expansions, increasing the number of seats for doctors and healthcare students. Speaker, over the next five years, we are adding 160 undergraduate and 295 uh, postgraduate seats to six medical schools. Medical and education expansions at Western, McMaster, the University of Ottawa, and others. This will ensure that Ontarians will always be able to have the health care resources they need here when they need them. Speaker, our government is creating concrete ways in which we can increase the number of health care professionals in this province. But as we know, Response. the NDPs and Liberals always say no. Speaker, I am proud to say that this government is keeping Ontarians safe with a high-quality health care system supported by high-quality post-secondary education. Thank you. My question is to the Premier. I bring to the floor the heartbreaking experience of the ODSP recipients being faced with housing questions and sus suspect evictions. Too often I hear about suspect trends of ODSP recipients' evictions because the landlord is moving in family members. By the way, a claim that is nearly impossible to prove wrong until after the fact. I spoke with St. Catherine's resident, Brenda LaCruz, who experienced this eviction. She was thrown into a housing market where she now has to borrow money from her friends to pay her new rent rate. Brenda spends 125% of her income on rent right now. Wow. Forget the food and forget the other costs. That's the reality for ODSP recipients. My question is, when will the Premier commit to doubling ODSP rates and support the most vulnerable people in Ontario. Here, here. Mr. Minister of Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, thanks Speaker. Uh, through you to the member for St. Catharines, uh, uh, I'd like to know more information about this eviction issue. Uh, obviously, we have a process in place. We have a rental housing enforcement unit as part of the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. In addition, there are means with the Landlord-Tenant Board so I, I'm very concerned about the uh, case that uh, the member opposite has uh, placed on the floor, uh, and I, I can rest assured that we will uh, get the, uh, the Rental Housing Enforcement Unit involved in this case and do further investigation. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. We're speaking about ODSP rates as well here, not only about what happened to Brenda LaCruz, but however, we have heard all week about this government's talk, talking point that the increase to ODSP at 5% is historic. 
The only thing historic about the increase is how long it took to make any increase. Freezing the rates for as long as you did throughout the pandemic is something we have not seen in decades. So, sorry, Premier, 5% is not historic. It's actually a slap in the face. But don't take it from me. Take it from members in my community of St. Catharines and Niagara. Tabitha Thomas is also facing a family moving in eviction and has called your increase proof for it doesn't care, may I quote, proof for it doesn't care about the vulnerable people. Brenda LaCruz said, quote, millionaires like Ford don't care about regular people like me. Question. Premier, will you change course and double ODSP rates in the face of your historical freeze to those rates from last term? Clock for a second. I, I realize the member was using quotes. It would be better if we refer to each other, generally speaking, as uh, uh, with respect to our riding boundaries as well as our uh, ministerial title as applicable. Start the clock. The response. The minister of community and social services. Thank you, Speaker. I very much appreciate the opportunity to clarify. Our government immediately began its mandate in 2018 by increasing the ODSP rate by 1.5%. We then went Order. into a pandemic, and we had the $1 billion social services relief funding. Order. We have now a historic, historic, a unprecedented Order. level of, of spending and increased investment in ODSP. But this, is, this does not exist Opposition alone. Come to order. We are aligning this to inflation, never been done before. We are creating the micro-credential strategy to make sure people can get back into the labour force, the roadmap to wellness, Official opposition across come to ministry order. effort, the, the $1 billion in childcare spaces, the Ontario Child Benefit, the dental care for seniors, low-income seniors, the care Response. tax credit, the lift tax credit, the never Ontario Jobs Catherine's Training Tax Credit. Credit, the Ontario Energy and Property Tax Credit, the minimum wage increase. We are making the largest investment in ODSP rates in the history of this province. We are aligning Remember them with Toronto inflation, and we will continue to do this very important work that the opposition never did. The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Solicitor General. Speaker, my constituents in the riding of Carleton are concerned by the increasing gun and gang violence faced by the people of Ottawa. Just last week, there was another shooting in Ottawa's Byward Market. This brings the total number of shootings this year in Ottawa to 41. The people of my riding don't deserve to live in fear because of the actions of criminals. The city of Ottawa is home to a culturally diverse population, good neighbours and friendly people. It's not a home for gangs engaging in criminal activity. So, Speaker, through you, could the Solicitor General please explain to this House our government's approach to dealing with this troubling issue faced by the good people of Ottawa? Thank you. Reply, the Solicitor General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for her question. And our hearts go out to the victims of senseless violence. Community safety remains a top priority for this government. And since the member was elected in 2018, our government invested over $57 million in the Ottawa Police Service. I have recently met with Chief Bell in Ottawa, and I know that we both share a strong commitment to keeping our communities safe. But we know that illegal guns continue to cross our international borders and into communities like Ottawa. And that's why, in my conversations with my federal counterpart, Minister Mendicino, I have stressed that the federal government needs to tighten up enforcement at the border. And this is something, Mr. Speaker, that we will work on. Notre government our government is taking our province's security very seriously and will always make this security an absolute priority. A supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And through you, thank you to the Solicitor General for that response. Mr. Speaker, the Solicitor General spoke about the issue of smuggled gum, guns coming across our borders. Recently, the National Post published an article titled, A Polite Reminder That Canadian Handgun Crime Is Mostly America's Fault. The article notes that 72 per cent of guns seized from crime by Toronto police this year alone had likely origins in the United States. 
Speaker, once again, through you to the Solicitor General, what is Ontario doing to address the issue of smuggled guns? Thank you. Mr. General. Mr. Speaker, and again, I want to thank the member for her question. And recently, I was in Lambton County on the St. Clair River with our MPP for Sarnia Lambton, and I was at the exact location where the drone carrying 11 handguns was found in a tree back in May. I saw for myself how close we are to the U.S. border and how easily guns and contraband can get smuggled in our country. And it's no secret where the guns are coming from. We've made enhancements to the OPP-led Provincial Weapons Enforcement Unit to combat guns entering Canada and in Ontario. And to keep Ontario safe, our government has invested over $200 million to combat gun and gang violence fueled by smuggled guns. Mr. Speaker, we will work hand-in-hand -hand with local law enforcement to tackle gun and gang violence in Ontario. But this is not enough. We cannot do it alone. We need our federal government to step up now and take measures to improve border security and inspections. The next question, member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, this government has established a pattern of leaving Ontarians in the dark about their plans. This time, they left us in the dark about the grave implications of Bill 7. Ontarians were rightly horrified by how quickly an undemocratic Bill 7 was passed. But the minister tried to pacify us by saying that our concerns about how far people will be separated from their families against their will be addressed through regulations. Well, Speaker, there's been no word about these regulations, but we're already hearing stories from hospitals putting pressure on patients. We don't need to create obstacles for elderly and disabled people to see their loved ones and their valued member of caregivers. Will the minister confirm that people will have regular and equitable access to their caregivers and their loved ones? Minister of Long-Term Care. Uh, uh of course, Mr. Speaker, I've been saying that right from the beginning, that the whole point of this was to ensure that uh, those uh, people, those seniors who are in a hospital, who are imminently to be discharged, have a better quality of care than sitting in a hospital bed where everybody would acknowledge, medical professionals completely acknowledge, that they're susceptible to various forms of, of different diseases which are not good for them, that they don't get the social activity that they require, they don't get the physical activity that they require, they don't get the mental stimulation that is required, and that a hospital bed is the absolute worst place for somebody to be. Now, if the member uh, had read the bill, he would understand that not only are we doing this, making sure that our seniors have the right care in the right place at the right time, but we're also putting money behind that, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that when a senior is leaving hospital for a long-term care home, that the long-term care home has the services that are required, whether it's kidney dialysis, whether it is behavioral support uh, uh, services. We are upgrading those services as well to match the patient leaving uh, uh, the hospital becoming a resident at a home. Yeah. A supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And back to the Premier. I want to be clear to the Minister. Not only did I read the bill, I memorized it. Speaker, this government refuses to commit to accountability and transparency. They passed Bill 7. They passed Bill 7 without so much as a meeting with the unions and frontline workers. They won't listen to advocates, patients, or their families. They're only concerned about what works for hospital CEOs. The minister denied Ontarians the chance to advocate for themselves, their loved ones, through public hearings. So my question is pretty easy. Will the minister deny Ontarians their rightful opportunity to comment on regulations during public comment period before the regulations are impl implemented? Mr. Longton Care. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the uh, parliamentary assistant, uh, uh, along with myself, have undertaken extensive uh, consultations uh, throughout the sector, both with residence councils, uh, uh, family councils, uh, uh, as well as with uh, applicable, applicable associations uh, to get, gather their feedback. We have also met with doctors and, and nurses to get their feedback as well. Uh, speaker, so we've met with doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals. We've met with uh, uh, representatives of, uh, of uh, residence councils. We've met with residents of long-term care home, and they have all come back and told us the same thing, Mr. Speaker, that a hospital is no place for somebody to be who is waiting for long-term care. These are people who are on the long-term care waiting list, Mr. Speaker. So what the bill does, 
Mr. Speaker. He read the bill, but yet he continues to say, oh, people are going to be charged $1,800 a day. They're going to be sent a thousand, a thousand miles Order. from their home. All incorrect. But he memorized the bill, colleagues. He memorized the bill. This is the, same, this is the same member who said we're going to reopen three and four war bedrooms. It was actually this premier and that minister who closed those three and four war bedrooms. It is that premier and that minister who uh, brought 58,000 new and upgraded beds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Rouge Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ontario's young families are being frozen out of the housing market due to a lack of housing supply. Ontario's population is continuously growing and our current rate of housing construction isn't keeping up. Young people are already struggling with inflation and the rising cost of living in Ontario. Over the next 10 years, we expect over one third of the new growth will happen in Toronto and Ottawa. Housing experts have already warned us that the Ontario is falling behind housing infrastructure investment because of the years of red tape and delays caused by the previous Liberal government. Speaker, can the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing tell us what our government can do to empower our large cities, such as Ottawa and Toronto, to increase the housing supply? Thank yeah. you. Minister of and Housing. Thanks. The member for Scarborough Rouge Park for that excellent question. The simple fact is, Speaker, that Ontario's population growth, uh, as, po as Ontario's population grows, our housing supply needs to grow with it. And, and what we're doing under our proposed Strong Mayors Building Homes Act is we're providing the mayors in our two largest cities with the tools that they need to get shovels in the ground faster. You know, we said to Ontarians during the last provincial election that we were going to present a plan to make sure that we have 1.5 million homes built over the next decade. And we have to ensure, Speaker, that the mayors in Ontario's two largest cities, where we know that over the next decade, a third of Ontario's growth will take place in those two municipalities. We have to ensure that after the uh, municipal election on October 24th, that those tools are in place for mayors in Toronto and Ottawa. That's what we're doing. We need to make sure Bonds. they have the tools to get it done. A supplementary question. Speaker, our housing market is facing a crisis. With rising living costs, many young Ontarians are starting to fear that they will never realize their dreams of home ownership. The people of my riding want more housing choices, whether it would be rental units or semi-detached houses near their workplace or fully detached houses where young Ontarians can grow and raise their families. Speaker, can the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing elaborate on what other steps our government is taking to ensure that the dream of home ownership is attainable for the people of my riding and all Ontarians. Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, we know that there's no one silver bullet uh, that will provide a solution to the housing crisis that we're facing right now. But for too long, under the previous government, housing starts lagged far, far behind the demand of Ontarians. We knew that we had to act and act decisively as a government by empowering our municipal partners, by ensuring that they have tools to cut red tape and get shovels in the ground faster. We're going to fight the housing supply crisis. We're going to ensure that that couple that right now doesn't realize the dream of home ownership, we want to give them hope. We want to give them opportunity, and we need mayors in those big communities, and quite frankly, mayors across this province, to have the tools that they need to assist us in ensuring that dream is realized. The next question, the member from Mishkegawak, James Bay. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier. Citizens Canada, in 2021, has indicated that during the last five services in French have not been provided appropriately. What are you going to do to provide those services accordingly? Thank you. Minister of Francophone Affairs. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, the member, for his question. These uh, results represent a national issue that is happening throughout the country. This is happening not only in Ontario, but also in Quebec and other provinces. Speaker, our government 
recognizes the importance of Ontarian Francophony, which is why we're working on several aspects to reinforce the demographic of Ontario. And we recognize that we need to set in place all the resources that we have to do so. We are continuing to work with the federal government and we ask them to provide more control over the immigration process to attract more Francophone immigrants to Ontario. Also, we request an immigration corridor to attract teachers of the Franco that are Francophone too. So, we have seen this issue keep on getting worse throughout the provinces. Services in French are not being provided appropriately. Ontario One Call doesn't provide a service in French. PPO for the security alert last week was only provided in English with a population that was 60% francophone. So again, my question is, what are you going to do to provide these services in French in Ontario? Supplementary, thank you, Speaker. It's very deceiving to see that the opposite member wants to play politics with this situation. This is not the moment. It's the moment to work together to make sure that we set in place solutions to address the demographics of Ontario. The opposite member knows that our government has set in place politics to protect francophonie in Ontario. The law was the first one that was set in the province since 1996. This could have been done during the Liberal government, but this didn't take place. They didn't do it when they were in power for 15 years, but it was our government under the leadership of this Premier that has got it done. We opened the Ontario University and provided courses in English, rather in French, to ensure the services in French. The member for Thunder Bay, Atacokan. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for Minister of Mines. Speaker, when the previous Liberal government was in power, they failed to prioritize the mining sector. Projects like Cote Gold sat on the shelf collecting dust because investors did not have a committed partner they could work with. The culture of delay and inaction by the previous Liberal government was unacceptable, and unlike them, our government wants more mines to get built in Northern Ontario. Mining represents a generational opportunity that is already creating jobs and training opportunities and promises new revenue for Ontarians. It provides the raw materials needed to build clean, sustainable, new green technology like batteries for electric vehicles. Mr. Speaker, what has the government done differently to move mining projects forward, and what have been the results? The Minister of Mines. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for the, quest for the question from the member from Thunder Bay and Atacokan. Mr. Speaker, opposite to the previous Liberal government, we see the benefits of unleashing the mining sector and re-establishing Ontario as a world-leading destination for mining investment. We have cut red tape and worked directly with companies to find solutions to challenges so companies can hit development milestones. We have seen the sector responding with Argonaut Gold building the Maginot project, Equinox building the Greenstone mine, and I Am Gold's Cote project finally under construction. And Mr. Speaker, the Cody Lake project is a world-class deposit, has a critical mass of 20 million ounces in resource, a world-class deposit that sat and languished for Response. 17 years. These are just some of the recent success stories, and we know there are more coming. There is more work to be done, Mr. Speaker, but I look forward to making Ontario the best jurisdiction to invest in the mining industry. Here, here. Supplementary question.
Speaker, unlike the previous government, we know how important mining is to the economy in the north. With Russia's unprovoked and illegal attack on Ukraine and the growing instability in Asia, the Chinese Communist regime attempts to destabilize that region. Our global partners are seeking a strong, stable and reliable source of materials. I know the Plan to Build Act lays the foundation for our government to strengthen Ontario's standing as a critical global mineral leader. Before the election, our government launched Ontario's first ever critical mineral strategy. Speaker, could the Minister of Mines update all members on what investments our government has provided to support the critical mineral strategy through the Plan to Build Act, helping to create jobs and opportunities for the people of my riding? Thank you. Mr. Mines. Again, Mr. Speaker, thanks very much for the question. It's very, very simple. We know that we can't be green without mining. That's right. And that's why our government launched Ontario's first ever critical mineral strategy, which is, by the way, a world-leading document. Here, here. This strategy is backed by investments including $20 million to find the mines of the future, create exploration jobs in the north, and work with the private sector on innovation. Through this strategy, we are building a link between the critical minerals in the north with the manufacturing might in the south. We are working towards a strong supply chain of extraction, processing, and manufacturing of clean technologies right here in Ontario. We'll be the world's leaders in this technology. This government's financial commitments and focus on development clean technologies will lead on further low-carbon low economic growth for Ontario, creating more job opportunities in the northern and First Nation communities. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning.